We're so thankful to our Lord above for all that He has done to make this possible, to make it so that we can walk in fellowship with Him and come together and worship Him and edify one another. If you're visiting here with us, we want you to know that you are a welcome guest. If you see something or hear something that maybe sparks a question, then take an opportunity and ask us the question. Give us a chance to sit down and to study with you from the Word of God. Last week we were looking at the first part of Mark chapter 8. And what we're going to be doing here with this lesson is continuing <laughs> Matthew. We're going to be continuing Matthew chapter 8. And we're going to be looking at the latter half of this chapter. The first part of it we looked at Jesus. He had just come down from the mountain where he gave what we normally call the Sermon on the Mount. And in the first section there going back up to verse 1 of chapter 8. He comes down and he encounters the leper and he heals the leper. And then starting there in verse 5 and following, it's the centurion and his belief, his faith that Jesus just by speaking it could heal his servant. And we talked about the faith of that centurion. And then there beginning in verse 14 down through verse 17, we even saw how Jesus healed his mother-in-law and many other people. So what I'd like to do this morning is pick up there with verse 18 and let's continue showing not just now that Jesus heals many people, but also the sheer display of his power and his authority. And so let's start that beginning now with verse, four, with verse 18. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go to the other side. We'll bring a map up here in a minute, but as we pointed out last week, they were around the area of the Sea of, uh, the sea of Galilee, there near the city of Capernaum. And so the crowd has gathered around, and so he gives instructions to his disciples there, to his apostles, that they are to go across to the other side there of the sea. But having said that, a scribe comes up to Jesus. A scribe comes up to him and says, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, what's interesting about that is that this is a scribe. This was someone with a, a very solid Jewish background. He not only uh, was re, uh, responsible for knowing the law, but also for teaching the law. This was his responsibility. So he says to Jesus, I'll follow you. Now, maybe he intended to go with them on the boat across the sea, but he said, I'm going to follow you. To that, Jesus says, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, let, for, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Follow me, and leave the bed to dead to bury their own dead. Now, I want to talk for just a moment about this idea here. He says, The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now, in a quite literal sense, Jesus had no home, no house, no possessions, really, as we would think about possessions, that he would be able to say, okay, this is my home base. This is my place to come to, to get away. These are my possessions. The fellow says, I'll follow you wherever you go. But Jesus says, listen, I don't have anywhere to go. And, and what I mean by that is he's saying, I have no home. I have no place to lay my head. Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but I have nowhere to lay my head. So the fellow who was wanting to follow Jesus needed to understand that following Jesus did not yield physical possessions. It did not yield some sort of end destination here on this earth where you could go and take a rest from everything because now you're at home. Following Jesus is to understand that we do not follow him for the things that we would perceive of the earth, but instead the things that we see beyond our life. Now, he does say in the text there, you probably noticed this, Jesus says, the Son of Man. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You've heard that phrase before. Jesus, on many occasions, refers to himself as the Son of Man. And we've talked about this before. This harkens back to Daniel's prophecy there. I saw one as the Son of Man in the prophecy there of Daniel chapter 7. But understand that the reference to Jesus as the Son of Man, I believe, is more than simply a reference to the prophecy of Daniel. 
It was very crucial and very, very pointed. But the idea of Jesus being the Son of Man, what might separate that from being the Son of God, is that Jesus was going to suffer. He was going to suffer greatly. And this is something else that this individual needed to understand. That following Jesus was not going to be a life of, of, of comfort, a life of reward, a life of great possessions and power. It's going to be a life of suffering. And what's interesting about all this is Jesus had the power not to go through what he went through, but he willingly chose to do this. Let me give you uh, two passages to consider. Turn with me first off to John chapter 8. Jesus here in talking to his apostles, notice what he says here in John chapter 8, beginning in verse 28. He says here, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as the Father taught me, I speak these things. So notice he says, when you lift up the Son of Man. Now, verse 29, and he who sent me is with me, the Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. Now, oftentimes we think of lifting up. We think of maybe Jesus ascending up into heaven and reigning at the right hand side of his father. But in these instances, he's talking about his death, his crucifixion, the son of man being lifted up upon the cross. Over in John chapter 12, verse 32, we see that more, more stated or stated more directly here. John chapter 12, verse 32 he says, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to me. This, he said, signifying by what death he would die. So the gentleman here, this scribe, needed to understand that following Jesus was not something that was going to be rewarding here on this earth as he might think it to be rewarding. Remember, a lot of people saw Jesus for his power. They saw Jesus for his authority, for his teaching. Remember when he came down from the mountain, everybody was amazed because he taught as one having authority. And so you would kind of think that those who would want to follow him would have some sort of expectation of being a part of whatever he was coming to do. But he's telling them, I don't have anywhere to lay my head. You can follow me, but understand I have nowhere to lay my head. There's, no, there's nothing to affix Jesus to the earth, to this life, to this world. And if you follow him, you need to understand that. Now, the next person, though, we have another disciple, he says there in the text there, says, uh, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Much like the previous statement there. When an individual chooses to follow Christ, they need to have the dedication they need to have the full commitment to follow Jesus above all other allegiances that we would have on this earth. Think about your life, your specific life. If you were to make a list of all the people to whom you are, to whom you are allegiant, well, who you owe allegiance or however you want to work for that. I was going to make comment, Brian's comment class this morning, English language stumps us up all the time. And we've been raised speaking this language. Whether you smite it or smote it, it doesn't matter. So the idea, though, that we're trying to, the point that I'm trying to make here with this is that who would you list on your piece of paper as the people that you're loyal to, that you owe allegiance to? Mother, father, children, grandparents, boss, employer, best friend, friend for life. BFF or whatever they say. Who would go on that list of people that you feel like you are to be loyal to, that you owe allegiance to? And the idea here with Jesus is that he needs to be the only one on that list. Okay? The only one on that list. He makes a statement here. Leave the dead to bury their own dead. Now, so, a passage is very similar to this. We see, notice with me, let's turn over to uh, Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 through 39. We haven't gotten to this yet in our study. But here over in Matthew chapter 10, beginning there in verse 37, he says something that I think falls within the same kind of understanding as what we just read. He says, a person's enemies will be those of his own household in verse 36. 
Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will, not fi will find it. Now, this is not to say he is denouncing the responsibility to honor your father and your mother. He's not saying that the husband no longer has the, the responsibility to love his wife as his own body. And he's not saying the wife who's a Christian has no responsibility to, to love and, and to honor her, her husband. He's not saying that. But in all of our responsibilities, he's the only concern when everything is put up by comparison. Sometimes if you're going to go buy a product and you're trying to decide who makes their product better, you might call up a comparison list. Well, the advantage of this versus this, advantage of that versus that. Sometimes price is an issue. Sometimes the quality of the component made is the issue. You go back and forth. With Jesus, there is no comparison. It's not Jesus, my husband slash my wife. It's not Jesus, my children, my boss. It's not that. It's just him. It's just him. And so in our lives, we do, we do what the Lord would have us to do in our service unto those around us and those that we uh, belong to, your husband, your wife, your children. But ultimately, he is all that matters. And this fellow needed to understand this. He needed to understand that when he chose to follow Jesus, that it would be Jesus and only Jesus that he would be following. Let the dead bury their dead. But now let's go to the next section. The next section here. Let's bring a boat into this discussion. Matthew chapter, um, there in 8, beginning there in verse 32. So we mentioned a while ago, the, he, he tells them, let's go to the other side of the sea. So they do. They get in a boat. The boat might have looked like something that you see up here on, there on the screen. Back in 1986 on the Sea of Galilee, they found an old boat. They dated about 2,000 years old. And they said this very well might have been the very boat, something like the boat that Jesus' apostles were on. But just think about this for a boat, for a moment, that boat. So they go down to get in the water. He gave orders there to go to the other side. So he got into the boat. His disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. And they went and woke him saying, save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? So I've tried, you know, oftentimes as a kid, trying to figure out where Jesus slept. I always had in mind a bigger boat, secondary level, not quite like a cruise ship, but you know, secondary level. So he was down there on a nice, comfortable cot sleeping and everything and they had to go down the steps and to wake him up but if this boat is even halfway near the illustration you'll notice there the front end of it that's probably where he was sleeping it's a possibility so now imagine someone sleeping through a storm in that setting so the storm builds the waves and the sea they begin to be rough and the people fear the the disciples on the boat they fear greatly and say so they go to him, the waves are coming up over the sides of the boat there. And they go to him, and they woke him up saying, save us, Lord, we are perishing. Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And so Jesus wakes up, and Mark's account has his statement to them being the following. Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Now the idea of the Greek word that's translated here as little faith uh, can carry the idea of maybe uh, lacking confidence. Um, another source said uh, ineffective faith. But it's interesting because in Matthew, in Mark's account, in Mark chapter 4, verse 40, he has him saying, how is it that you have no faith? And there it is that, that conviction, that persuasion, that would also carry the idea of trust in the Lord. And Luke's account says, where is your faith? 
Now, looking at this from our standpoint, we might ask ourselves, why would he respond in such a way? Because is it not natural that they be afraid with what they were going through? And the answer would probably be, yes, it is natural. But then you've got to consider, but look who they were with. Look up to this point, all that they had seen, everything they had heard, but yet they turned to him. And so that's, he's not being overly hard on him. He's being very straightforward with them. Where is your faith? Or, O oh, you of little faith. So they woke him up. He says this, and so he says to the storms and the seas. He tells them to calm down. He rebukes the wind, rebukes the sea, and there was a great calm. And then verse 27, the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this that even winds and sea obey him? So we see Jesus so far in Matthew's study, his power over illnesses, his power um, to be able to heal people. But now we see him displaying his ability to control the winds, to control the waves. Now, this is not the first, I, the first time in scriptures that this idea that Jesus, that God would have this ability. David, over in 2 Samuel, he talks about this. 2 Samuel, the Lord had delivered David from his enemies. He had delivered David from the hands of King Saul. And so in 2 Samuel chapter 22, start reading there beginning in verse, uh, verse 2 there. David says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my strength in whom I will trust. This is 2 Samuel chapter 22, now verse 3. The God of my strength in whom I will trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior, you save me from violence. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. Now, jump down into the text, though, to verse 17. All right, continuing there in verse 17, notice what he says here. He says, he sent from, I'm sorry, verse 14. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. He sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning bolts and vanquished them. Then the channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of the world were uncovered at the rebuke of the Lord, at the last of the breath of his nostrils. The reason why I bring this is the idea of God being able to control nature is nothing new. David saw that. David understood that that was God's power and might. And so here we now have an individual who is the son of God doing the very same thing. And so when they saw this, his disciples, those who were on the boat with him, it says they marveled. And they asked themselves, what kind of man is this? Who that even the winds and the waves obey his very voice. What does that say to us And acknowledging the authority of Christ? This is one who can control the very universe in which we live, the very elements, the very makeup of the world. Let's listen to him above everyone else. Let's listen to him only. So let's continue forward, though. So here's back to the map we used last week. Down here to the southeast of the Sea of Galilee is a city called Gadara, about six miles, I believe, to the southeast of the Sea of Galilee. And you'll see why that's rare, rare, a little bit relevant here in just a second. So continuing forward there, and when he came to the other side, I believe he's talking about the other side of the city of Galilee. Go back up to the top, you had the area of Capernaum. And so they set out, they sailed across during the night. At some point on the other side of the sea, they came to the country of the Gerardines. Now, the New King James translation um, will use the term, I'm not sure if I can say it right, Georgicenes. But Mark's account in Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 5, verse 1, does call it Gerardines, even in the New King James translation. So that's why we associate it with the city of Gadara there towards the bottom there. Okay, relevancy coming up here. He came to the other side to this country. Two demon-possessed men met him, coming out of the tomb so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? 
Now a herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them. And the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. The herdsmen fled, and going into the city, they told everything, especially what had happened to the de demon-possessed man. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. So let's go back to the start of this. A couple of observations we need to make in lessons kind of learned from this. So we have two demon-possessed men that Jesus meets here. They are so fierce in their behavior that no one could pass by them. But when they saw Jesus, they said to him, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Now, I'm not even going to pretend to know what demons know. But they knew who Jesus was. And they didn't say Son of Man. That was his reference he used about himself. They saw him as the Son of God. But then the second thing they asked him was very interesting. Have you come here to torment us before the time? We oftentimes talk about what's going to happen when the Lord comes again. We talk about how Jesus defeated the devil. I would strongly suggest that when the demons in this country said, have you come here to torment us before the time? I would strongly believe that they knew what was coming. That they knew that their time was almost up. James chapter 2, there in verse 19, James says, even the demons believe and tremble. So here we have the case in point of Jesus walking up. They know who he is, the Son of God. And they said, have you come here to torment us before the time? Listen, if demons fear and tremble because they know that the time is coming, it should cause us to stop and listen to the Son of God as well. So as we continue in the text here, they looked over. They saw a herd of, there was a herd of pigs over there. So uh, Mark's account tells us there was about 2,000 pigs within this herd. And some commentary suggests that this area of Gadara... One of the chief exports or sources of money was their swine, the pigs. And that's relevant here in possibly in understanding something that happens here in just a minute. So they asked Jesus, don't cast us out. Why would you choose to be cast into a bunch of swine and not be cast out? Sorry about that. You ever wondered that? They said to him, don't cast us out. Cast us into the pigs. Why would they choose to live in the body of swine than to be cast into wherever he was going to cast them? Not sure about that, but that's what they asked for. So he did. He says, go. So they came out and went to the pigs, and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. Two thousand. Two thousand of the swine. They ran and killed themselves running into the sea. Now here you have the herdsmen. They probably saw what happened. I'm going to say probably. Saw what happened with this demon-possessed man. And they saw what Jesus allowed to happen. And they saw the outcome of, of how all the, the herd of swine killed itself, running down into the sea. So they fled. And they go into the city... And they told everything that had happened, especially, that's why I said they knew what had taken place with the demon-possessed men, especially what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Now, there are a couple of other times that when people go and tell about Jesus, there's a good response. Remember the woman at the well? She goes, she tells others about Jesus and all that he had said about her, and they came and listened. It was always a good thing when the people would hear about what he has done and come and listen. But this, this one goes a little bit differently. All the city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. They witnessed something that I believe was kind of foretelling to what was going to happen. You think about the idea of the swine rushing longward down into the sea. 
to that, the lake there and perishing. And all the demons that were in those swine rushing headlong into the lake where they perished. Kind of reminds me about the ultimate defeat that's going to come as described in Revelation chapter 20 there in verse 10. Revelation chapter 20, let's read that, and then we're going to show why this is the case. Real quick. Revelation chapter 20 there in verse 10. You see the imagery of that the devil who received them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. It makes sense that they would tremble in the presence of the Son of God. It makes sense that they would be fearful in the presence of the Son of God. Because the end outcome, the defeat that God will have over them and has had over them through the death of Christ upon the cross of Calvary would mean their eternal demise, their eternal demise destruction. Turn back over with me now to Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 and 15. The Hebrew writer says the following about Jesus. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. They knew their defeat was coming at the hands of Jesus. They knew that they would be destroyed and their, end, their end outcome would be at the hands of God, the judgment of God upon them. When we step back and we kind of look at situations like this, it should drive home within our hearts and minds and maybe help us in trying to bring others to Christ to fully understand the power of God, His authority, and the sacrifice that Jesus made when he gave himself to die upon the cross of Calvary. It was, yes, shedding of his blood for the remission of our sins. But it was also a defeat of Satan. It was a defeat of death. So that now we no longer have to fear dying. We no longer have to worry about that. Because what comes next for us when this puny physical body finally expires is eternity with God in heaven. And that should drive us. That should drive us. I say drive us. That should be who we are in serving our Heavenly Father. Looking back at this account in Matthew chapter 8, we ultimately see in the previous, in the previous sermon the miracles that Jesus did about healing. But now in this one, we see Jesus showing the commitment that is necessary to walk within his footsteps. But it's a commitment without an earthly guarantee. It is a commitment without earthly power and things of that nature. And then he shows his authority, not just over the physical realm, that was the waves and the sea, but his authority within the spiritual realm when the demons feared him and obeyed his command. If you're not a Christian, you need to obey the command of Christ. You need to turn to Him for salvation. You need to turn to Him for the forgiveness of your sins. You need to hurt, turn to Him to, for reconciliation to the Father in heaven. You can't do it by yourself. You can't do it on your own. You can only do this if you truly are convicted that Jesus has died for you and you're willing, willing to submit your life wholeheartedly and follow Him. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then I pray that your belief this morning is enough to say, I must turn away from my life of sin and obey His call into salvation. If you're willing to make that repentant change, then make the decision this morning to be buried with Christ through baptism so you'll rise up then to walk in the newness of life. This is how we live faithfully through our Heavenly Father, because of the fellowship that we have with Him, because of the price that Christ paid so that we could be set free. But it's a conviction that you must adhere to today. If, you're not a Christian, if you are a Christian, then you need to continue serving God faithfully. And if you do find yourself straying from the fold, then come back to Him. Repent 
and be restored back to his service. If you need the prayers of the congregation, are you ready now to become a child of God? Come forward as we stand and as we sing.